Today, I am going to break down my entire process for creating my most popular plugin, Truly Handheld for Final Cut Pro. And because it was completely built in Apple Motion, that means it required zero programming or coding experience to make it happen. So the first thing I did was obviously open Apple Motion. From there, I selected the Final Cut effect because I wanted to make this appliable in Final Cut. And from there, I set my preset to 1080p. I set my frame rate over to 60 frames per second and I set the duration to 30 seconds. With the project to open, I right clicked to create a new group and I'll just call this the handheld recording group. Then selecting the initial group that was already there, I'll rename that to be the effect source group. With the handheld group selected, I'll push command I to bring in some footage. And I filmed this footage at 60 frames per second with six different lens types, one of which being 55 millimeters. So we'll go ahead and take this 55 millimeter footage and select import. Watching the beginning of this video, you'll see that I have some pretty big shakes that I don't quite want in there. So I'll move forward to about three seconds to get past those and push I. That's going to trim it down. Then we can just click and drag this over to the very beginning of the project. So it should start off a bit smoother now without having any of those really large shakes that you might first see. It was important to me that this was perfectly loopable. So to achieve that, we're gonna do something called ping ponging a little bit later. But to first set that up, we're gonna to wanna to go over to 14 seconds and 59 frames and push O. That's going to trim it to exactly 15 seconds. If we zoom way in here, we can see at 14.59, there's still one more frame afterward. Moving to the very beginning of our scene, let's select the 55 millimeter handheld footage, go up to behaviors, motion tracking, and select analyze motion. And we're just gonna use the object tracker in motion. So I'm gonna create this box to be the same size as the paper surrounding everything. Then we'll go over to the inspector and we will push analyze. With that finished, you'll see that there are thousands of different keyframes here on the timeline. And in fact, if I push command eight, we can see that motion has created thousands of different keyframes because it's creating 60 keyframes for every second of video. And there's also multiple axes that it's working on. So there are a lot of keyframes here. And something to note is when you have this many keyframes in motion, it actually can slow it down if you have the keyframe editor open. So I recommend that you close the keyframe editor unless you need it, which we will in a little bit, but we'll keep it closed for right now just to speed up performance a bit. Now that we've analyzed the motion, we can actually apply this motion data onto something. So selecting our effect source group, we'll actually go forward to the 15 second mark. So we'll go to 1459 and we will push O to trim it down. And this is gonna be important because motion can randomly add extra keyframes that you didn't originally intend if we don't trim it down. Now that we've done that, go up to behaviors, motion tracking, and select match move. From there, we can drag the analyze motion data into this well. And now the effect source is going to receive all of the motion data that we track. So if I disable the original video file, you'll see how our effect source is moving around just as it should. Now that it has all the motion data we want, we just want it to be rotation and position. We can select the effect source and push command K. This is going to convert all of those keyframes from the motion parameter behavior into actual keyframes. So before we couldn't really edit the motion data at all, but now we'll be able to edit it and smooth it out if we want with a smoothness slider, or more importantly, we'll be able to ping pong the animation, making it perfectly loopable. So let's go ahead and select convert. Now that we've done that, we can go to the very end of our video and push O with the effects source selected, and we'll wanna verify that there are no keyframes after that point. Here you can see that motion randomly created another keyframe at the very end and we don't want that. So go ahead and just delete that keyframe so that it's completely gone. So now we have no additional keyframes here at the very end. Now we can zoom back out and with our effect source group selected, we can go over to the keyframe editor. In here, you'll see all of the motion data points that it has created. And what's important is that this is perfectly loopable. So to achieve that, it's going to be a lot easier if we take all the motion data up to that 15 second point and then just play it in reverse so it gets back to its very original location. So selecting all of the keyframes within this window, we can click on this down arrow and select after last keyframe ping pong. So now you'll see that motion has created all these extra data points for us. And if we get to the very end of our video and we push play, you'll see how the motion is going to loop perfectly. Something you'll see 
is that there are actually black edges surrounding the effect source and that's just because there is no extra video data over there on the edges. Originally I created it so you could scale up to get past those black edges but I was always annoyed at the fact that that would change the actual framing that I originally set up in my original shot. So I wanted to create the ability to repeat the edges of video and I could not find a tutorial on how to do this. I know there are a lot of people that know how to do this but everywhere I looked there were no tutorials so it took me a very long time to figure this one out on my own I'm sure there are resources out there I just could not find them otherwise I would totally be linking to them what you're going to do is select the effect source group and it's very important that it is the group not the original effect source so selecting that effect source group will go up to filters We'll go down to tiling and select collide a tile. Now from here, we'll find in the width and height section, we're gonna need to set those to 50% of 1920 by 1080. And that is because we are working with a 1920 by 1080 timeline. So we'll set this over to 960 by 540. And now that has shrunk down to be 50% of our original scale. Currently our effect source is at 100% and we need to shrink that down to fit within this Kaleida tile. So selecting that effect source, we're gonna set this down to 50%. So now it will fit inside of this Kaleida tile effect. But you'll notice that it's still not repeating the edges. And that is because this effect source group is actually scaled improperly. Currently it is also scaled down 50%, because if you go to the group settings, it doesn't have what's called a fixed resolution. So it's important that you check this box to be a fixed resolution, and now it's going to perfectly mimic the edges of your video. But you'll notice there is a very tiny seam here on the edges, so what I recommend is you actually take off a few pixels here. I'll set this to 958 by 538 and that will clean up those edges nicely. But the problem is, is we are still zoomed way out on this effect, so everything is just gonna shrink down and we're gonna have these weird repeating edges. So to bypass that, we select our effect source, we go to our properties, and now we need to actually increase the scale of this effect source back to its original scale. So let's go ahead and clear out any animation data that has been added to it. We'll reset that parameter. Then we'll just set this to 200%. So now our video source is back to its original scale, but on the edges, you'll see there are no black edges because it's repeating them and now they're off to the sides. So that is how I created this repeating edge effect for my plugin. The next thing that was really important to me with this effect was to make sure it had a smoothing feature so you could actually smooth out the keyframes to make it feel like it had a little bit more weight to it. So you could go all the way from feeling like it's a tiny DSLR to being a big steady rig. To do that, we'll go into our effect source and we'll go and find the position data. Let's click on this down arrow, add parameter behavior and select average. So what this window size will allow us to do is actually smooth out the keyframes. So we could set this up to 20 and that is going to smooth it out considerably. Now it's a little bit hard to see here in motion, but you definitely notice the effect in Final Cut Pro. So what we want to do is make it so we can publish this effect over into Final Cut. So going to the right side, we'll click this down arrow and select publish. Now if we go to our project, we can go into our project settings here and find the window size parameter has been published. Double click on that and we can actually rename this. So we'll just call this smoothness. And now somebody can drag the slider up to a full 20 to really smooth out the effect or they can drag it down to zero to really feel like a tiny DSLR and it's really up to whatever you wanna do with this effect. Another thing I wanted to do is make it so you can enable or disable rotation on this effect. So selecting our effect source, we'll go back to our properties and find the rotation parameter. We're gonna click on this down arrow, add parameter behavior and select clamp. What the clamp parameter behavior allows you to do is actually lock in exact parameters to a maximum amount. So if you didn't want it to ever go above the amount of 90, for example, you could set the clamp at 90 and now your rotation can go all the way up to 89, but then when it hits 90, it can go no higher. So currently by default, it sets the maximum to 572. That is totally fine. What we're going to use this clamp parameter behavior is for a toggle. 
So finding this max parameter, we'll click the down arrow and we're going to add it to our rig, create a new rig and select checkbox. With this checkbox, you'll notice it's deselected here by default. Let's set it down to a parameter of zero. Now, if we enable it, you'll notice how that jumps up to 572. When it's disabled, all the rotation parameters are going to be locked at zero. But when we enable it, it completely opens it because now the rotation can go all the way up to 572 degrees if it needed to. And if you wanted it to be even more, you could set that to a thousand or whatever you like, but the default is 572 in motion. Now we can go ahead and rename this checkbox to be enable rotation and we will click on this down arrow and make sure it is published. So if we go to the project and go to the project settings here, we can see that we have our smoothness slider and our enable rotation slider. Another parameter I wanted to add to this was the ability to reverse which direction the actual handheld movement was going. Because naturally I was favoring a certain side on the video and if somebody wanted to make it so they could favor the other side with the handheld motion, they could do that. So selecting the effect source, I went up to this down arrow and we're going to select negate. The negate parameter actually just completely reverses the numbers on the parameters you've selected. So rather than it being a positive X and Y movement, it would actually be a negative X and Y movement, thus shifting where I was actually favoring with the camera. In the negate parameter, we can click on this down arrow and make sure we publish that. And then we can go into our project settings and in here we'll see we have the ability to negate it. And you can actually just change reverse direction or whatever you want to call that parameter behavior. And now that is fully toggleable in Final Cut Pro. So that is how I added some of the various parameters for the effect. But a question I get all the time is how did I add the custom thumbnail for my effects? Now in motion, it's very easy to add a custom thumbnail to something when it's an effect source. All I need to do is actually go into my finder and click and drag whatever thumbnail I've created in any photo software onto the effect source. And now Motion will set that as the thumbnail. Now there are other ways to create thumbnails that are a little bit different for different motion types like titles and generators, but this is the easiest way for effect sources. Now I have everything in place, but there is one last very important step and that is to tell Motion how long this animation needs to take to play out. Because Motion automatically stretches whatever timelines you create within it to fit within a Final Cut Pro timeline. So currently if I were to apply this onto a one second clip, it would condense down the motion speed to one second, making it really fast and jittery and the complete opposite of what we want. So to do that, we're gonna go to the very end of our project and push Shift M. That's gonna create this marker here. We can double click on that marker and change the type from standard over to project loop end. And so now motion knows the loop point of this and it's going to know the actual timing within Final Cut Pro. So now that we have all of this set up, we can push command S to save it and we can just call it whatever we like. I'm just gonna call it handheld tutorial and throw it into my tutorials category, but you can of course do whatever you like and push publish. So now that I'm in Final Cut Pro, I can just click and drag the effect we have published over here and you'll see it actually has the thumbnail that we have created. Up here in the top right, we have all the different parameters we want to affect. So I could drag up the smoothness, enable rotation and reverse the direction. So that is a quick look at how to create a plugin for Final Cut Pro using Apple Motion. And if this video was helpful to you, you really might wanna check out this video where I show you 10 beginner tips for Apple Motion. With that being said, I cannot wait to see you in the next one.